Hello everyone, welcome back to the Away Say on the Gallagher Trust YouTube channel. We are back after that abysmal game against Brighton where I think that will not live long on in the memory. Um, but the next challenge may as well be onwards and upwards at this point. We're travelling to Leicester for a Super Sunday, another lovely trip courtesy of Sky. Um, joining us this week as our guest is Chris from First for LCFC. Thanks for coming on. It's all right. So uh, I thought I'd start uh, just to talk a little bit about signings. Um, obviously, you guys were the forefront of deadline day and you know the transfer saga in general with Harry Maguire um 80 million big fee how do you think you've managed without him so far honestly we've discussed this in our own podcast and I just don't think that there's a difference I think there's probably a positive impact if anything I think um since he's gone to Man United you know his, his lack of pace has sort of been found out maybe um you know we've got Sionchu last season he was um not know, far quad yeah, he was there uh, <laughs> last season. He was playing with the under twenty threes. He wasn't quite ready for that Premier League step up, but you know him and Johnny Evans this year is like it's flawless. I think have we got the joint best defense in the league? I think on goals conceded. Um, so yeah, literally eighty million in the bank. Um, it's a shame that we couldn't get anything away from uh, Old Trafford, but um, honestly, like I think ninety five percent of Leicester fans would agree that um, you know eighty mil will Just take. Do you think he was overhyped by the World Cup? Because we, we experienced this with Sissoko um, at the Euros when he was terrible for us, had an amazing international tournament and then Spurs obviously bit our hand off for him. Do you think there was an element of that with Maguire? I think it's it's the whole English premium thing, isn't it? Like any mm. any, any English international, like, I mean, you got players like Jesse Lingard, for example, like, I don't, how's he stealing a living at, at Man United? Do you know what I mean? Like, I, well, obviously, Harry Maguire's a lot better football than him, but I do feel there's an element of his English slap a massive price tag on him. Um, yeah, the World Cup. I mean, he did have a good World Cup. Um, but for me, I, I do think the main factor is um, his nationality. He's, he's a great player, but 80 mil, I think we were laughing at that as much yeah. as uh, anyone else. I think we had that a little bit with Sean Longstaff as well. I think there was an element of that where... Um, I think we just wanted to price out Man United if they were genuinely interested in him. But I think at the same time, we could justify it by saying he's young and he's English, so let's just say he's worth £50 million. Um, And he was nowhere near that even when he was playing at his best at the end of last season. So I think you're completely right there. Um, in, in terms of other signings, um, obviously one of your bigger incomings was one of our biggest outgoings in Ayose Perez. He was, a, he was a player who very much divided the fan base 50-50. And I would say the way he plays football is pretty much 50-50 as well. He used to have amazing runs in the second half of the season when he'd score ridiculously important goals for us, really skillful goals as well. Um, but then you would kind of forget about him for the other half of the season. Looks like you've had that less impressive Perez at the start, would you say? I think 50-50 is uh, putting it generously. It's, it's pretty much 95-5, well, well 99-1. I don't know. Like We've not seen anything positive of him. I think the best he's done, actually, I was watching obviously the Spurs game at the weekend um, it was a disallowed goal, but he, you know he chipped it over the keeper. He, sort of, he was he remained calm under pressure, but I don't know whether it's because we played him out wide. He, he'd rather play central. He played central last night against um, Luton in the cup. Um, didn't score, but um, you know he, he seemed to be a bit more comfortable there. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You know. Um, He's he's not he's not been that good in the Leicester shirt. You know he's been dropped already this season. Nice. Um, so I mean I think everyone wants him to perform. I think everyone wants him to probably start against Newcastle and kickstart his season there. But I I don't see it myself um, right now. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of Newcastle fans who would probably ruin the fact he's not doing great. I mean I had him tipped as a I think when he signed for you I actually messaged you and said I think he'll do really well in that side. Mm. Um, because he is really talented and he was always a great finisher for us. And I think he did get a lot of stick from our fans for not really being a grafter, but I do think he used to put himself about quite a lot, which I think is why Rafa liked him. And I always thought he suffered from being in a team where we couldn't really, we kind of played in a number 10 for us and he couldn't really do anything because he used to get the ball and he was expected to take on four players. Mm. He might get past three of them and then everyone would scream at him when he couldn't get past the fourth. When really we, we like players who like to try and have a go like that. Um, I think I think his best position is probably just be like a second striker or up top on his own, but he's never going to displace Jamie Vardy in that side, is he? Um, well, it's interesting you should say that. I mean, this is team news as of today. Uh, James Madison is well fifty fifty, I think, yeah, for the Newcastle game. Saw that. Um, so the discussion is who's what's the tactics going to be? Is someone's going to replace him as a sort of number ten? 
there's going to be a second striker. So potentially Perez in behind Vardy, and this is his chance in the Premier League. I mean, if he has a storm, I'm not really sure what's going to happen to tactics. We'll probably put Madison back out wide, but he's not been that good there. So, yeah, I won't be surprised to see Perez in behind Vardy, but um, yeah, I mean, right now he's he doesn't excite anyone, I don't think. He's, his work ethic is good, he's energetic, but he's nimble, but you know, that's not getting you goals, is it? No, and I think Newcastle, when you're at home, will be a really good opportunity for him as well, because in the recent weeks when we've lost Longstaff and we've had um, Shelby playing, it's been so easy for players. I mean, me or you could just step in that midfield and just walk past Shelby because the lads on our podcast were saying he's a bit of an empty shirt at times. And I don't think it's necessarily lack of trying with Shelby sometimes, but he's just so immobile and slow. So I would think in this game, if Perez is really going to do it, it's going to be now when if, if Hayden's out of the game, he's going to just okay. walk past Shelby. Um, so I, I think tactically that would work. Um, What's it likely to be out wide? Is it likely to be is Tielemin still fit? And you've got that other lad as well. I can't remember his name. But... Um, in terms of the, you got Harvey Barnes. Obviously, yeah. uh, Damara Gray. He scored. Did he score one? Assisted one or two last night. So it could be them two out wide. Like I said, so far we've had sort of Madison start on one side. That's that, that's realistically not going to happen. If he is going to play, he'll play in behind Vardy. Um, you know, or Brighton. It's it, it. We might not even play with width. That's the thing. You, you, Brendan Rodgers is still in that phase of sort of figuring stuff out. You know, if I was to sort of second guess him, I'd, I'd think we're going to start with Ndidi. Probably not two holding mids. We've got we've signed this guy called uh, Dennis Pratt as well. Mm-hmm. He used to play alongside Tielemans. So Tielemans Pratt. There's quite a lot of rotation in there. Um, Brendan Rodgers obviously likes a possession game so we're likely to probably saturate a lot of the possession but it just depends how resolute you guys are because we was discussing in our podcast yesterday previewing this match um under Rafa it felt like he might play negative similar to sort of Mourinho but there's there's like a master plan behind that yeah you might try and play negative with Steve Bruce but it's not I don't think the level of sort of preparation and that is is going to be the same um, so it might be a bit tough to break down, but I think once we start banging on the door, hopefully, unlike last season, we will be able to uh, score and make it count. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. Steve Bruce is he's obviously being criticised since he started, but um, I saw that we you mentioned possession. We haven't had more possession in any game this season. And then Steve Bruce has come out in the press and said he's going to play on the front foot less. So I don't really know what that means. I don't know how that's possible. Um, we're, I think we had less possession against Brighton than Watford did against City when they got lost 8-0. So it's a strange one because I think we have signed good players um, and the potential we've, we've seen with players like Almir on that we, we can do it. But like you say, a team like Leicester, if they're going to keep the ball, I can't see what we're going to do to break it down really other than really bomb through on the break. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned about new signings um, before... We have obviously made some new signs in the summer and one criticism that's been levied at the minute is against Almiron. Not from a lot of fans, but a little bit in the media. Um, he's a player that we obviously signed um, in January last season. Um, sort of bits of brilliance, but hasn't been able to consistently do it in a game or get any sort of attack in return at all. You don't have to talk about Almiron specifically, but what do you think is the most important thing for a player, whether he's come overseas or not? How, what's the most important thing for him trying to settle in a team, do you think? Um, well, first of all, I, I did watch, well, painfully watch the Newcastle Brighton game at the weekend. Oh, lad. Um, <laughs> I did actually uh, fall asleep at one point, but um, no. To be fair, Almiron, again, when you come over to the Premier League, I think he, you've got to got you've got to have energy. But I think that, you know now you have to be technically sort of sound, and I think that's maybe where he's sort of lacking at the moment. So you you, you, can, you can run like hundred miles an hour. Um, but ultimately, like you said, you're going to be running into brick walls. You're going to be hitting that last defender or you're going to be running the ball out of play. It has to be more thought through now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, something that was frustrating, I think we went too far the other way under Claude Puello. He was buying these, like, tricky, like, French, like, unheard of midfielders that, if anything, they slow the game down too much. So I think ultimately you've got to find that balance. Someone like Yuri Tielemans, obviously I'm going to mention him because he's a Leicester player, but he, he was linked with top four sides. 
you know, he's got that balance. He can slow the game down, but he can play that incisive pass. Um, and I think every team, if every team has one creative playmaker like that, it's a massive difference, isn't it? Yeah, it's about controlling the pace of the game, isn't it? And there has been a, a criticism of Almiron where it says, just, you are rapid, but just slow down and think about the mm. game a little bit. And I think in, in the MLS, you would get away with that a bit more because you can just run at 900 mile an hour and the pitches are so massive and the, the standard of football is obviously not great. You can just get away with basically FIFA tactic of just having a quick player holding mm. right trigger or R2 or whatever and just bombing it up the pitch. And I don't think that works in real football. But I mean, from what you saw of him in that game when you weren't asleep, you can tell he's a, a good player, can't you? But it's just not happening for him for whatever reason. Um, do you think? Do you think there's always an element of, you know, just time, with things like this? It's, it's, it is a tricky question. Like, he was obviously he's obviously rated highly. Um, I think it's also to the players around him, though, isn't it? I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know. For example, say you do say you put Almir on in, I don't know, a Man City team. I mean, ultimately he's got a better coaches there, so that's maybe not fair, but it better than ultimately Steve raises you. <laughs> Ultimately, he raises your game. I guess maybe someone like Jack Grealish is a good example. Like mm. everyone says, if you put him in a more technically sound team, surround him with better players, he's going to shine more. It's so maybe the reason Almiron's just absolutely pelting it, like roadrunner everywhere, is because he feels like he has to put it on himself. Mm-hmm. But, that's, but then Newcastle, like you're a Premier League side, you should have you've got enough players. So I don't know. Maybe it, he just needs better coaching. Um, I, I actually think you're right with that. I do think he puts a lot of it on his shoulders. Um, and I think the fact he still hasn't scored, there was there was a time where, um, you know, he's he's been on the floor and he's trying to like crawl the ball in the goal. He's so desperate. And I think I think you're right. I think he just he needs the players around him. But the way we play football, it doesn't really work at the minute. But yeah, I, I take your point on that. Um, on about Brendan Rodgers before, um, I, I can't remember if we spoke about this last time, but obviously a bit more time's passed since then. Um, were you surprised that he basically bailed on Celtic halfway through what was essentially going to be a treble winning season? And after that, how do you think he's he's done so far? It's I mean, it's when you're talking about Scottish football. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we've had a lot of hate from Celtic fans since. I don't really care anymore. But um, I'm not surprised, no. I think it, say it gets boring is obviously sort of disrespectful, but to an element it is like yeah he could have stayed for that treble treble but like it was sort of in the bag and when a big off well I'm not saying Leicester like a huge club but when an offer from a Premier League club comes in you know he doesn't know when his next offer is going to come does he like I think he went for just like anyone would in their career you know you're going to try and get a better job a lot of people are saying he's going to use Leicester as a stepping stone but you know ultimately Say he gets us into the top four this season, which you know, only six games in or seven games in, it's not looking unlikely. You know, how many better teams are gonna sort of come for him? I mean, obviously, people are saying Spurs and stuff. I think no, I think he's got his head screwed on. Everything he says in the press is sensible. He's talking about building a team. He sounds confident, so I think we're all happy with him. I think maybe there's an element of everyone thinking, is he going to do it to us? But like I said, so far so good. Well, I think I think even if. uh... He does end up using it as a stepping stone. If he gets you into the top four or top six or whatever, you know, he's still done a good job. And I don't think you could really have a go at him. And that just puts you in an even better position to then get a good manager again. So I think when you when you with, with one of the problems we had at Newcastle was that we had we had a manager in Rafa that we could have invested in and then built it up. And then when Rafa did leave, we could have got a decent manager instead of Steve Bruce. So I think there is an element that we're lesser. And I think Scottish football aside, I think it says a lot about where Leicester are as a club. And we obviously talked about the ownership last time, um, but I know you've, you the ownership still going strong. Um, and le- it looks, I mean, it must be a good time to be a Leicester fan moving forward. Yeah, I think there's stuff that probably isn't in mainstream press. Like we are building probably what's going to be the best training facilities in the country. So again, infrastructure is always a word that was mentioned with King Power uh, ownership. And yeah, they look after the club, they look after the community, they're looking after the whole club from grassroots up. So. Yeah, there's no doubt in the ownership that 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 could be there for for multiple years to come. Well, hopefully, touch wood. But um, yeah, I think it, you know if they get Brendan Rodgers to buy into that, then yeah, he could be here for years as well. But um, I'd say the foundations are there for a for a hopefully good future. Yeah, and we're still stuck with a paddling pool for our ice bath, and Mike actually selling off half the city. So yeah, no, I've seen, but... seen your uh, squad photo the other day, and obviously we've got players got... in there who aren't even in the squad. I don't understand yeah. that. But Henry Savage is never going to play for us ever again, and he's just sat there in the background. 
really strange, but <laughs> no. Nah, but yeah, I, I always like to read the comments on um, anything Newcastle posts on their Twitter because you know you sort of know what you're getting. Is that was that a joke about him putting a cash point in that uh, mural, or is that did that actually happen? No, that's always been there. Oh, has it? Yeah, it, I think it just it was just a good metaphor. Uh, if people watching don't realise the the mural on the um, the Gallagher Melbourne corner. Um, they've put a brand new mural of basically saying the fans are great. Then right in the middle of it, there's a massive Barclays cash point, which is kind of just, uh, I think it's a very good metaphor for the way the clubs run, to be yeah, honest no, with you. Yeah, I thought it was yeah. funny. I didn't know whether it was a new thing or not, but <laughs> yeah. No, definitely not. No, nothing new gets put into that ground apart from rubbish murals. But anyway, um, let's talk about the game itself then, really. Um, we've talked a little bit about how you think the squad's going to line up, but the game in general, we've had a bit of joy at Leicester recently. I went to the game a couple of years ago when Perez dinked it over Schmeichel and it was unreal. <laughs> um, but I, I, this time around, there's not that same level of belief. Uh, Newcastle confidence is pretty much rock bottom at the minute and yours is obviously pretty good even without Madison. Um, how do you see it going? Well, you asked me this question last time um, and I was very confident uh, <laughs> and we <laughs> lost. So um, was it a loss last time? Last season, yeah, uh, I don't know to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it was a positive result anyway. But either way, this time round, I'll say the same as what I said uh, last night with the lads. I do think we it's going to be our second clean sheet of the season, and I think I've gone three nil on my predictor. That it's always worrying going that confident with Leicester, but two or three nil, I, I do see a, a relatively dominant performance. Um. I think if we strike early as well, the confidence might increase. I think the longer, as with any game, the longer the game stays goalless or you take the lead, um, we haven't really been tested that much. And when we do go behind, well, over then against Spurs, it's typically a stumbling block for us. But Sunday, 4.30, again, the crowd, it's a, it's a significantly smaller ground than yours, but it, it does play a big role for us. Um Rogers has mentioned it being a fortress or building it into one. Yeah, I do think uh, two or three nil uh, for me. Yeah, we we did win that game. I've just looked it up there. Twelfth of April, twenty nineteen. I also Perez. <laughs> yeah, and no, I remember. Yeah. So, so it... the last two wins at that in yeah. at, uh, at Leicester were both with Perez. So again, if he can't score in this game, then I don't know what he's <laughs> I don't know what he's got to do. To well, be he's probably going to score an own goal and it'd be one nil again. To be fair, so. I mean, if he manages to chip Schmeichel again, I'll be <laughs> impressed. To be yeah. honest with you. I mean, our, our team that week, it's going to be pretty much the same. I mean, that game we had, basically the back five, the back five we're going to have this time around um, with Hayden and Key, Almiron, Rondon. He's obviously not there anymore. So, yeah, I think it'll be a, a similar game. But like you say, we aren't on that same level that we were uh, under Rafa. And I can't see it going any other way. And I, I don't want to embarrass myself by saying we're going to get anything out of this game because I, I, just, I just don't see it personally. And, and I have watched Leicester a couple of times and I do think you're not really good. Um, I don't think it'll be a maul in. I think it'll be one of those games where you just steadily grow into it. You get all the ball. We might have a patch here and there where we create the odd chance. Joe Linton looks good, so if he does get a chance, he might bury one. Um, but I can't see anything other than, you know, a 2 0 defeat. I don't know if you disagree or agree. I know you're saying it's probably about on par with what you're saying, really. No, I think it's, um, it's interesting you say um, about growing into the game. Yeah, maybe. Maybe I'm a bit rash in predicting us going all guns blazing. I think we will start fast, but we do tend to hit a bit of a lull sometimes as well. So yeah, maybe yeah, maybe a goalless first half. But I, I do I do see once we get one, putting more pressure on. But two or yeah, th- yeah two or three. I, nil. I think that's right. The only way I can see it going any differently is if we do manage to get the first goal, because we've shown against Spurs away last uh, this season that we can do the back to the wall stuff still. Something that we've done really well. You know, the past five, six years, we've always done it really well where we've got backs to the wall, you know, springs to mind even under, I think that might have been McLaren or Pardew at the time, um, when we Tim Kroll broke the record for number of saves in a game. He made like 25 <laughs> saves or something. So we can do it. So I, I think we're both on the same page with this. I think, you know, a fairly dominant Leicester performance, two or three nil win. But if we do manage to get the first goal, um, who knows? Just um, on a side note, um, yeah. if if twenty five saves is correct, imagine the bonus points in fantasy football. For oh, that unreal, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, got, I've got Nick for every three saves. Yeah, well, I, I did. I, on a massive aside, I had Raheem Sterling in my team, 
So I, w- I was dreading it when Pep decided to bench him. But big John yeah. Lundstrom, Sheffield United, came in with 12 points. I was absolutely buzzing. Yeah, um, I was having, yeah, Salah as captain and that was relatively miserable. It's been a difficult season for it this year, hasn't it? But uh, yeah. quick, quick final question, season prediction for the two teams, Zion and Leicester. I wrote an article or answered some questions for an article for season. I said fourth. I did say fourth. I'll stick with fourth. There you'll get, you'll get some hate for that saying yeah. fourth, I think. But. At the time, there was a lot of, uh, well, yeah, probably blue tinted glasses. But like I said, Arsenal, Chelsea, Man U, Spurs. You know, can you put a good case together for any of them right now? Yeah, I think on the face of it, you say Leicester and you scoff a little bit. But I mean, Chelsea look shocking defensively. Man United look shocking in general. Spurs always bottle it. It's a good opportunity to do it. I don't think anyone could argue it that badly against Leicester doing quite well if you keep going yeah I mean yeah, like I said realistically we want top six uh, but I, I do th- I just think that third, even third place is in the end of the day you won the league as well so you, you can't really discount you but for anything as far as I'm aware the top two are written off and it'll be a massive gulf but then anything below that and in terms of Newcastle um, I don't think you're going down but then like between like 17th and Ninth, there's probably going to be like a, a 10 point blanket to throw over it. I've always had a soft spot for Newcastle. Like, you are ultimately a big club. I've been to the ground, I like it. I, I don't know. Yeah, between <laughs> it is impossible. Yeah, yeah 12. Yeah. I'd say 12 just because. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. I think that's the most optimistic prediction we've ever had on this channel. So I'll, I'll take 12. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think, yeah, like there, there'll be a blanket throw over about 10 teams. Yeah, but to be fair, that used to happen in the Rafa seasons. We were down there, down there, and then we'd win four or five games in a row. And you do just jump up, don't you? So, yeah, yeah, I'll take that. I, I, I predicted us to go down. Uh, we don't know what the other lads on the pod have done because they, they've kept it a secret. But I think we'll go down, especially when you look at how Norwich and Sheffield United have started. I am slightly concerned. but They'll fade, they'll fade. We shall see. But uh, that probably about wraps it up. Um, thanks very much for coming on once again, Chris. I appreciate it as always. Um, best luck for the season. Likewise. Cheers, mate. Thank you.